Hello, you are watching the Light Nova Spirit video series on the theology of the body. In this video, we are focused on audience 39. So we are your hosts. I am Jeremy Hossauter. And I'm Guillermo Moreno. Uh, audience 39 continues where we left off with audience 38 with um, discussing the desire of the heart. Okay, so we have Matthew 5, verse 27, verse 28, it begins with the sixth commandment. Then Jesus says, I say unto you, whoever desires in his heart, right, the man who desires in his heart, the woman, so as to make her an adulteress, has already committed adultery in his heart. We are focusing on this desire of the heart, but I say unto you, right. So needless to say, we'll dive in. So we want to begin with this text of Sirach chapter 23. It's a great text. And for me, when I first read it, it really helped clarify theologically what is what does concupiscence even do to the person? Um, Guillermo, would you like to read this? Yes, I would. A reading from the book of Zyrak. Desire, blazing like a furnace will not die down until it has been satisfied. The man who is shameless in his body will not stop until the fire devours him. To the impure man, all bread is wheat. He will not grow tired until he dies. The man who is unfaithful to his own marriage bed says to himself, who can see me? There is darkness all around me. The walls hide me. No one can see me. Why should I be afraid? The most high will not remember my sins. What he fears are human eyes. He does not realize that the eyes of the Lord are 10,000 times brighter than the sun. They see all the acts of men and, and penetrate into the most secret corners. Likewise, the woman who abandons her husband, who provides him with heirs, received from a stranger the word of the Lord. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I must have been tired when I type this because why on earth would i <laughs> dude we it's a couple w -E -E -T. <laughs> and you forgot the space between the man on the first line oh man i, I was as royal in laughter as you're reading that when i saw that <laughs> the thing the because i use two different spell checkers on this when i make these yeah how th was that not caught is hilarious i hear i thought maybe oh that gets the turn of the word spell week uh, I have no idea where that came from. I don't think so. That is so funny. All right. So looking at this text here, Sirach belongs to the wisdom tradition, which as we, if we recall from the previous audience, we are looking at the wisdom tradition to precisely gain some insight as to this adultery as desire in the heart. And so we have this description here of desire being like a furnace. It's a fire within the man that consumes him. It devours him. He, and it's something that doesn't stop until man dies. He, it's, it's, it's a description of man just being consumed by this kind of desire, this hedonism. And we can see that the text also shows that he begins to conform how he thinks around it, right? Because the man who is unfaithful to his marriage says, who can see me? There's darkness around me. He's trying to rationalize his pursuit of this concupiscent desire and so this is kind of a text we want to keep in our minds as imagery of what of who is the concupiscent man and what is this desire that is being condemned in matthew 5 verses 27 28 so moving on then we can see um now, some elements of this text. So we have this comparison between concupiscence of the flesh and fire. This concupiscent passion suffocates man's conscience in the heart 
and his sense of responsibility before God. Concupiscence is described as this restlessness of the body and the senses. And the inner man, so this is the man, think man as a person, his um, properly what's attributed to his subjectivity. This is silenced by the outer man. And that's to say that the passion, these desires, they are given a freedom of action towards satisfying the body and the senses. And so the concupiscent man, he's trying to find satisfaction for his passions, or he's trying to find rest by satisfying those passions, by satisfying the desires of his body and the senses. But in doing so, he only finds restlessness. And because of this restlessness, he is he becomes worn out, he consumes himself, and this leads to exhaustion. It's a way of living that just exhausts man morally and spiritually. Um, Guillermo, did you have any other thoughts about this text to share with us? I do not. Okay. So now we've had this concept introduced to us before, but now we need to formally look at it more. And it's the concept of the look. So Christ's words in Matthew 5 express the fact that each man and woman understands the meaning of to look with desire. This knowledge is an interior one. It's within the heart and conscience. And the desire of the heart, this adult, this a concupiscent desire is expressed in the look. The look expresses man as a whole. And so the look to desire is an experience of the, of the value of the body such that its spousal and procreative meaning cease. And this leads to a detachment from the spousal meaning of the body and the ability to establish the community of persons. This is hence a inner detachment within the heart of man. So the look is the exterior act of this interior desire. And it's a very, I found this concept of, you know, just the look to be very opening. And what is really interesting is when we look at Jean-Paul Sartre. So Jean-Paul Sartre was a famous French existentialist philosopher. He was an atheist and believed that everything was absurd. Now, I claim that he's a hidden interlocutor of JP2. The reason being is because he's nowhere mentioned in the theology of the body. I don't know of a reference to Sartre in JP2's corpus, though there's probably one somewhere, I'm sure. But the point is, he's not mentioned significantly in JP2's work. But in the 1930s, Sartre wrote his giant tome called Being and Nothingness. It's an 800 page book. And within this 800 page convoluted work of nonsense and all sorts of silly things, you have 100 pages on what Sartre calls the look. And the look for Sartre is a very, he has this 100 page analysis and it's very interesting. And I believe that this is probably one of the sources for JP2's own use of the concept of the look. So let's spend a moment to talk about Sartre. So with Sartre, when someone looks at the other, this makes the other an object 
for the person that is looking. And this objectification is described like a drain hole. So when I objectify you by looking at you, you as a person essentially have your personhood drained out. It's like a drain hole where your personal being is going down the drain. And he uses this imagery of a drain hole and other provocative language like internal hemorrhaging. You get these very interesting images just because of kind of that existential mode of philo phil philosophizing that is represented by Sartre. And this is to do this objectifying is kind of making use of you for my own purposes. It's you are an object for me to use. And this is kind of the theme, one of the general themes of Sartre's works. If you read some of his plays and whatnot, or some other existentialist thinkers like Albert Camus, I'm thinking of his novel, The Stranger. Man exists as a being to be used. And when I look at you, you become an object for me. And the interesting thing about the situation for Sartre is that your self, the self-defense of defending yourself against this looking is by looking back. So it is by looking back that you can defend against this objectification by the other. So let's think about this for a moment, right? We know this concept of the look and shame that JP2 talks about, there are also themes in Sartre where you look, where you have the look, you have the, the arousal of shame, you have this objectivization of the other, the other person comes an object for me. But what Sartre does is says that in order to defend myself against this objectivization of myself, I need to look at you first and make you an object for me. In other words, you are a threat to me by making me something, a tool to be used by yourself. So to defend myself, I'm going to make you a tool to be used for myself. That's Sartre's view. And you can see immediately what consequences that has for sexuality with concupiscence, because now what in terms of sexual ethics, what Sartre is saying is by me looking at you with concupiscent desire and acting out upon it, I'm defending myself by using you first and by using you. Right. And then JP too, he's saying, well, if you do that, you just make yourself a tool to be used as well. And when you do this, you are the man of Sirach 26. You're consuming yourself. So, and what JP2 is pointing out is, or what he will point out in the future is that man can be redeemed. The body can be redeemed. You have this, you have the resurrection of the body, you have the redemption of the body through Jesus Christ. Someone like Sartre, on the other hand, says there is no redemption of the body. The best you can do is just use the other person before they use you. So in other words, for someone like Sartre, hell is to be preferred because hell is the, essentially hell is the mode of operation of all human beings because we're just using each other. There is no true love. There's only use. You're using each other for your own ends and purposes. And JP2 is saying, no, there is redemption. There is love. You can break out of this cycle precisely by this 
conversion of heart from concupiscent desire, from this adultery of the heart. And that is a significant thing to come about, to think about. For someone like Sartre, there's only a despair of the body of this interpersonal relationship because it's all about use. It's all about objectivization. And JP2 is telling us that no, you can be redeemed. It, the book, Being a Nothingness by Sartre, I do not recommend to the, our listeners to read because it is a 800-page convoluted mess. And Sartre, on purpose, uses confusing language to mess with your heads and make things seem plausible that are really actually just quite terrible. And he does that on purpose. It's kind of part of the writing style of being a nothingness. But this, is, I think, is an important point when it comes to understanding the theology of the body and some of the sources or ideas that JP2 is encountering in the 70s and 80s. Sartre was alive in the 30s, or well, alive in the 30s. That was 30s, 40s, 50s, he's like high of his career. And so this is, this is something to keep in mind as when it comes to the intellectual climate that you do have these people that will say to you, that will say to JP2, the concupiscent man is who man is in essence. And that's how we should live, in fact. And that is a reality of our modern society that some people will look at concupiscent man and say, yes, that's how you should live. And that is precisely what we are trying to move society away from to say, no, there's something beautiful here. Love, fulfillment, flourishing, happiness, ultimately redemption, resurrection. Guillermo, do you have yes. anything you'd like to add on to our audience? You know, uh, just to add on to your, um, just what there is. Um, the last thing you said, resurrection, of course, yeah. And yeah, just to build on that eternal life. Um, the one question I had about uh, uh, Sartre, I, how did you come across Sartre? So for me, it was just studying Sartre and my graduate work for philosophy. Because um, a lot of my philosophical reading was in the continental school. So that means existentialism and phenomenology. So I've read Sartre in um, various contexts for some of my classes. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, those are my only thoughts. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, I guess the thing with Sartre is he has some, there are some insights that you can glean from him, like some of his analysis of the look and shame. But you have to keep in mind that for Sartre, it's strictly within essentially this view that essentially man is hell. He, he explicitly says in his play, no exit, hell is other people. He, Sartre did, just didn't realize that oneself can also be hell but the the thing is just simply he recognized hell as other people the reason for that's because of this just brutal objectivization of other people to be mere tools for use 
but for him that's the absurdity that's what reality is and there's no escaping that for sartre to live authentically is to use people as mere instruments that's disturbing to if i interpret it correctly to see individuals use this terminology as such like we know we're using people yeah and that's the point that's the point we're making and that we're trying to say that it is a good point yeah well it's but just real quick, part of the reason why I phrase it that way is because I think too many times we're just not conscious, like in our hookup culture, namely that we're not conscious of using each other. Like in a way we are, but um, just in some way, shape or form, we're, we're blind to the whole fact because everyone can know um, what it means to use someone. Yeah. But we don't take pride in we, we don't use that rhetoric and take pride in so doing. Right. We we try and rationalize it to in order to cope with our okay. sin. Yeah. All right. That's really what a lot of our public discourse is rationalizations for sin for uh -huh. using each other. You just take abortion. This is my body. Well, yeah, it's your body. But what about the child whose life that you are determining with your actions? You know, my body, my right, sure. But what about the life and body of the child in you? You know, you, you get these rationalizations that have an element of truth, but then you get the equivocation and the irrational conclusions whether it's abortion, hookup culture, as you said, you know, or just, or I think masturbation, it's a healthy thing that animals do. So you should do it too, to re reduce stress. I'm like, no, it's not healthy. It destroys lives. Some people masturbate too much that they can no longer, or that they become impotent. So they can't become married because they can't commit, they can't actually make the sex act anymore. Because they masturbated too much. Did you have anything else, Guillermo? I did not. Okay. In that case, then, after our interesting side topic of Jean Paul Sartre, as I said, the book where he has his 100 page analysis is from being a nothingness but i highly do not recommend the general listener to read it because one it is a confusing read and he is being ambiguous on purpose to manipulate you that is how he wrote the book and so yeah also, it is an 800 page thing. And if you're going to dedicate yourself to reading 800 pages of something, you should read something more uplifting like Dostoevsky or Tolstoy. All and right. the Theology of the Body. Or Theology of the Body, only 500, 400 pages. True, true. Yeah, you probably, I think the whole Bible is like 800, 900 pages, depending on your edition. Depending on, yeah. All right. With that, thank you for watching our video. If you have been enjoying our content, please subscribe, like, share, and comment on our social media. Also, please consider making a financial donation to our um, organization. Your financial support goes towards our maintenance of our website and the purchase of resources so we can continue providing you with great content that you know and love. Um, you can support us through paypal patreon or giving us a cryptocurrency tip through the web browser brave you can um speaking of our great content you can 
find a lot more material on our website, lesnovospreet.com. We have many great articles on theology, philosophy, culture, etc., and also a podcast. Um, Guillermo, do you have anything more about our podcast and more information for our listeners? Yes, in our other series, we talk about a variety of topics such as trends in culture and politics, and we upload our episodes onto buzzsprout.com. You can find our page through the La Novella Spree website under the podcast category, and you can listen to us directly on Buzzsprout, or you can use it to find us in other platforms such as in other podcast platforms such as apple podcasts google podcast excuse me google podcasts and spotify um just to uh, re-emphasize you can find all of our social media on the web page ladenovellspreet.com slash subscribe how to support us financially what, what our social media profiles are and where to find our podcast. Did you have anything else to add, Guillermo? I would just like to ask our viewers and listeners to keep us and our mission in your prayers. Yeah, please continue to pray for us. And with that, I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. God bless.